Amphibious warfare is a type of offensive military operation that today uses naval ships to project ground and air power onto a hostile or potentially hostile shore at a designated landing beach. Throughout history, the operations were conducted using ships' boats as the primary method of delivering troops to shore. Since the Gallipoli campaign, specialized watercraft were increasingly designed for landing troops, materials s, and vehicles, including by landing craft and for insertion of commandos, fast patrol boats, zodiacs, rigid inflatable boats, and for mini submersibles. The term amphibious first emerged in the United Kingdom and the United States during the 1930s, with the introduction of vehicles such as the Vickers Carden Lloyd Light Amphibious Tank, or the Landing Vehicle Tract. Amphibious warfare includes operations defined by their type, purpose, scale, and means of execution. In the British Empire at the time these were called combined operations which were defined as operations where naval, military, or air forces in any combination are cooperating with each other, working independently under their respective commanders, but with a common strategic object. All armed forces that employ troops with special training and equipment for conducting landings from naval vessels to shore agree to this definition. Since the 20th century, an amphibious landing of troops on a beachhead is acknowledged as the most complex of all military maneuvers. The undertaking requires intricate coordination of numerous military specialties, including air power, naval gunfire, naval transport, logistical planning, specialized equipment, land warfare, tactics, and extensive training in the nuances of this maneuver for all personnel involved. In essence, amphibious operations consist of the phases of strategic planning and preparation, operational transit to the intended theater of operations, pre-landing rehearsal and disembarkation, troop landings, beachhead consolidation, and conducting inland ground and air operations. Historically, within the scope of these phases, a vital part of the success was often based on military logistics, naval gunfire, and close air support. Another factor is the variety and quantity of specialized vehicles and equipment used by the landing force that is designed for the specific needs of this type of operation. Amphibious operations can be classified as tactical or operational raids, such as the deep raid, operational landings in support of a larger land strategy such as the Kerch-Altigen operation, and a strategic opening of a new theater of operations, for example, the Operation Avalanche. The purpose of amphibious operations is usually offensive, except in cases of amphibious withdrawals, but is limited by the plan and terrain. Landings on islands less than 5,000 km2 in size are tactical, usually with the limited objectives of neutralizing enemy defenders and obtaining a new base of operation. Such an operation may be prepared and planned in days or weeks, and would employ a naval task force to land less than a division of troops. Intent of operational landings is usually to exploit the shore as a vulnerability in the enemy's overall position, forcing redeployment of forces, premature use of reserves, and aiding a larger allied offensive effort elsewhere. Such an operation requiring weeks to months of preparation and planning would use multiple task forces or even a naval fleet to land core size forces, including on large islands, for example, Operation Chromite. A strategic landing operation requires a major commitment of forces to invade a national territory in the archipelagic, such as the Battle of Late, or Continental, such as Operation Neptune. Such an operation may require multiple naval and air fleets to support the landings, and extensive intelligence gathering and planning for over a year. Although most amphibious operations are thought of primarily as beach landings, they can exploit available shore infrastructure to land troops directly into an urban environment if unopposed. In this case, non-specialized ships can offload troops, vehicles, and cargo using organic or facility wharf site equipment. Tactical landings in the past have utilized small boats, small craft, small ships, and civilian vessels converted for the mission to deliver troops to the water's edges. Preparation and planning of the naval landing operation required the assembly of vessels with sufficient capacity to lift necessary the Zodiac Milpro Futura Commando 470, or in short FC-470 Combat Rober Rating Craft, CRRC, also known as the Combat Rober Reconnaissance Craft, is a specially fabricated rubber inflatable boat often used by the U.S. Navy, U.S. Marine Corps, the U.S. Army, and others. The CRRC is typically called Zodiac, referring to the boat's manufacturer, Zodiac Milpro. The boat can be used for over-the-horizon transportation, inserting lightly armed raiding parties or reconnaissance teams onto beaches, piers, offshore facilities, and larger vessels. The CRRC can be inflated in minutes by a foot pump, compressor, or CO2 tank, and can be deployed from shore in a variety of vessels. Additionally, it can be launched from several types of aircraft and submarines equipped with a special lockout chamber or dry deck shelter. Its chief advantages are lightweight, compact size when stowed, stealth, versatility, and the safety imparted by a super buoyant nature, which gives it the ability to operate on relatively high seas. A total of eight individual airtight chambers comprise the FC-470. The main hull or gunnel contains five intercommunicating chambers, which are separated by internal baffles and valves. 
This means that a single leak will not result in loss of pressure throughout the boat, and that air can be bled between chambers to compensate for the loss in one. Two additional chambers, located below the gunnel on either side and called speed skags, provide cushioning for the boat's occupants, and additional buoyancy in case of pressure loss in the hull. The final chamber is an inflatable keel tube that runs the length of the craft, and gives the bottom of the hull a V-shape, imparting directional stability and additional shock absorption. A wooden transom board at the stern provides a mounting point for the outboard engines. The deck, floor, is composed of four interlocking aluminum plates, which are fixed to the thrust board at the bow end, and the transom at the stern. This rigid structure, spanning the entire internal area of the boat, prevents the hull from collapsing, or tacoing under power. US Marines from the Battalion Landing Team 2 halves go ashore in a CRRC during a 2003 exercise. A ready-for-use craft includes an outboard engine, two in some configurations, removable aluminum deck plates or roll-up slatted decking, paddles, a bow lean for securing the dock boat, and a writing line which is used to flip the boat in the event of capsizing. At the bow of the boat are storage bags for equipment, foot pumps, extra lines, and a special fuel bladder, which can be of either 6 or 18 gallon capacity, and which feeds the engine via a flexible hose. Deflated and rolled up, the boat and all necessary equipment can easily fit into the bed of a small pickup. Most military CRRCs use a 55 horsepower, 41 kilowatts, two-stroke engine with a pump jet propulsor, which consists of a shrouded impeller. This design reduces the risk of serious injury to personnel in the water, when compared to the traditional open propeller. It also reduces the risk of the propulsion system being seriously damaged by submerged objects. A specially trained coxswain sits at the stern, rear, of the boat, and controls it via the tiller arm, attached to an outboard engine. The coxswain is considered the commander of the craft, and is ultimately responsible for its operation, regardless of whether a senior-ranking individual is on board. Across from him sits the assistant coxswain, who relays hand signals from other boats and aids the coxswain as required. The remaining passengers, six raiders plus the two coxswains make up a full team, normally lay on and straddle the gunnel, keeping a low silhouette to help avoid detection and leaving room on the deck for weapons, equipment, and additional fuel bladders. Because the CRRC offers no protection to its occupants, and is itself highly vulnerable to small arms fire, operations involving it almost always take place at night, and depend on the elements of stealth and surprise.